Good morning, everybody. We're going to uh, talk a little bit this morning about our liberty. Uh, they, uh, there's, there's been some issues going on in our society recently across America that threaten liberties. Uh, our liberty of, of, of people from being able to do uh, what it is that they want to do and what they need to do. And it's real important that we have an understanding of what our liberty is. And it's not a text that we normally talk about from the scriptures. Uh, there's certainly a lot that, can, lot that can be said about the liberty that we have in Christ in this dispensation of grace. Uh, there's certainly a lot that be, can be said about being set free from the dominion and power of sin as believers. And there's a lot that we can say about the Word of God with regard to what God says are the laws are that we should be governed by uh, and that we should submit to His truth when it comes to what true righteousness is. Uh, we have the, uh, the righteousness that, that is written, this God standard of righteousness in the law. And... We don't, we're not under the law today in the dispensation of grace, but there are certain moral, there's a moral code in the law that hasn't changed with regard to, to what sin is and the consequences of sin. So we're going to talk a little bit about those things this morning, but be, we're going to begin by talking about the definition of liberty, what liberty means. Uh, that's kind of important. I know I needed to review. Uh, we don't hear a lot of, of said about our freedoms and our liberty uh, in, in movies and in TV shows and, and what's being our education, uh, ed educational system uh, is getting weak when it comes to talking about the, the privileges and liberties that we have as American citizens today. So I just want to look at, we're going back to a diction, dictionary that is, uh, was uh, published in 1828. It's Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Liberty, by definition, there, there were 10 different subcategories for the definition. We're going to look at the first five. The first is, liber, uh, is liberty in general, the general sense of the word liberty. Freedom from restraint in a general sense and applicable to the body or to the will or mind. The body is at liberty when not confined. The will or mind is at liberty when not checked or controlled. A man enjoys liberty when no physical force operates to restrain his actions or volitions. Now, the word liberty, the word that comes to mind is freedom, right? Freedom and liberty. Those words go together. We have the Statue of Liberty that represents the freedom, the liberties that we have as a country. Uh, and the word, uh, we think of our free, and the definition said it has to do with your body, like freedom not to be constrained, like in a jail cell or locked up or told you can't leave this boundary. You have to stay within this area. So there's physical restraint when it comes to liberty, and then restraint of the will and of the mind. What you decide to self-conduct yourself. Liberty, freedom of will. God created us with a free will. God gave man a free will to choose whether man wants to submit to God in faith and respond to God in love, or reject God who he is, what he represents, and hate God is the other option. So we can choose either one with our will. God doesn't, did not create us to be robots and, and force us as his creatures to uh, submit to him. That would be uh, oppression. That would be tyranny. And God is not a tyrannical. God is not a, a God that forces his creatures to worship him. So you have the Liberty, and you see in that, in the definition, a man enjoys liberty when no physical force operates to restrain his actions or volitions. The word volition has to do with having a free will. So I just thought it was interesting when you talk about freedom, uh, when you talk about the word liberty, it, it by definition is freedom from restraint. Uh, the second de definition under liberty is natural liberty. And natural liberty 
consists in the power of acting as one thinks fit without any restraint or control except from the laws of nature. It is a state of exemption from the control of others and from positive laws and the institutions of social life. This liberty is abridged by the establishment of government. So the second way to think about liberty is a person living on an island without any government, without any institutions, without a social set of standards that he needs to worry about conducting himself on that island. He, natural liberty, he can do anything that he wants to, to express his will or actions or, or uh, where he goes with his body on that island. He's free, he doesn't have anybody oppressing him. If he wants to jump off a cliff, the only thing that's going to keep him from jumping off the cliff is the natural law that when he hits the rocks below, uh, that he'll, he'll only jump once. He'll only use that freedom once. So there's the idea that if he likes fire and he wants to lay down in the fire, the natural law is going to destroy him from doing that. Otherwise, there's no written law that says he can't, no government to come in and say, you can't lay in the fire. You can't jump off that cliff. So that's the idea of living without any, uh, without any civil law. The third definition of liberty in the dictionary is civil liberty. Civil liberty is the liberty of men in a state of society, or natural liberty so far as only abridged and restrained, you get the idea, they're only restricted, as necessary and expedient for the safety and interest of the society, state, or nation. So a restraint of natural liberty, not necessarily or expedient for the public, is tyranny or oppression. Civil liberty is an exemption from the arbitrary will of others, which exemption is secured by established laws, which restrain every man from injuring or controlling another. Hence the restraints of law are essential to civil liberty. The liberty of one depends not so much on the removal of all restraint from him as it is on the due restraint upon the liberty of others. In this sentence, the latter word denotes natural liberty. So to read that sentence again, the civil liberty of one depends not so much on the removal of all restraint from him as on the restraint upon the natural liberty of others. So. Chaos would be an example of natural liberty. Somebody just does anything he wants to, regardless of what laws there are in, in the society they live in. Civil liberty protects that person from that person who is not restrained by the law from doing harm or injury to them. And that's where uh, the sentence it says, civil li liberty is necessary for the exp uh, and expedient for the safety and interest of the society, state, or nation. So in order for the society to be protected, there has to be certain laws that keep somebody from harming you just doing whatever whim or desire they have to have their way that would restrict or harm others in that society. Okay, so the next definition is political liberty. And political liberty is sometimes used synonymous with civil liberty, but it more properly designates the liberty of a nation, the freedom of a nation or state from all unjust abridgment of its rights and independence by another nation. So that would make you think of why uh, a one world uh, system or one world government that would restrict that nation's ability to make its own decisions, that would be governed by a, a, a United Nations or some controlling other right, one world government or power. Um, so the, uh, or globalism, sometimes it's referred to. So the liberty, we're gonna see if we get to it in, in, in the next few minutes, was given by God to the world uh, as for nations to have individual autonomous ability to decide what laws they have to govern the people in their, in their nation. And that's protection for the freedom of individuals to be able to seek God 
uh, to be able to worship him in the way they see fit. And it protects uh, uh, individual nations from the oppression of another nation that doesn't see that that, that freedom is important to do that. Uh, the last definition here that we're going to read is religious liberty is the free right of adopting and enjoying opinions on religious subjects and worshiping the supreme being according to the dictates of conscience without external control. Now we appreciate and enjoy our religious liberty uh, in this country, but there are many uh, that would like to see that restricted or taken away from us. And so one concern that a lot of believers have in this nation is our ability to freely worship as we believe God would have us worship him to meet and to be able to study his word and to be able to freely talk about the content of God's word with other believers and to have freedom to believe that and, and fellowship together around his word. Now, think about uh, with this in the sense of those definitions that we read, Adam and Eve, in a sense, were created and given natural liberty uh, by their creator. <clears throat> and God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden and talked with them daily. But their liberty uh, was given one law to restrict their conduct. And you remember what that law was that God gave Adam and Eve. You can eat any tree in the garden. All these trees are yours for food except for one. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I don't want you to eat that. And I'm warning you that if you do eat it, you'll surely die. So it was a warning for their safety not to eat of that tree. In a sense, it was poison to them. And God was saying, don't eat it. You'll die spirit, soul, and body when you eat of that fruit. And of course they disobeyed God and we know that the sin nature that was, uh, that was involved to cause them to, uh, to doubt God's word. They were tempted certainly by Satan to eat of that fruit because Satan did not care for the fact that they would die physically, spiritually, and their soul would die when they ate it. He didn't care for them. He tempted them to eat it because he, he was envious of their power and what God had given them, and he wanted to usurp the power for the control of the earth away from Adam and Eve. And there's, there was a lot involved. That was an attack by Satan against God's creation, the creatures, uh, creation, Adam and Eve, and God's plan to set up a human government on the earth. And so Satan uh, usurped that, and he wasn't doing it for the good of Adam and Eve. Uh, he did it for his own sake. So he, again, uh, made, made the sin nature that ended up being passed along from Adam and Eve to the rest of God's creatures, the rest, rest of God's creation. Now, go to Romans chapter 1. Now, God created man with three natures, as we've said, spirit, soul, and body. And uh, God gave us a conscience. And God made natural laws. And, and when you think about sin that came as a result of Adam and Eve partaking of that fruit, the sin nature, God gave man freedom up until the law was given in Exodus through uh, by God on tablets of stone to Moses for the nation of Israel to govern them by as a nation, a new nation. Um, before that, for about 1,600 years from uh, Genesis 1 until, until the law was given in Exodus chapter 20, man didn't have a written law to govern him, but there were consequences for sin. Galatians, the verse says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, uh, that shall he also reap. And there are consequences for sin. So God gives man a free will, lets him decide if he wants to do this or that. If it harms him, God will let him suffer the consequences of that which he does. So God is a loving God. God uh, gives man warnings about what to do and what not to do. Let's man know, with, and, and we're going to look at the verse now, that says God gave every man a conscience to be able to understand the difference between right and wrong. 
And the knowledge of God is included in that conscience that God gave, gives to every man. Verse 18 uh, of Romans 1, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, that uh, even God's eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So no creature born, no son of Adam and Eve born, uh, can claim to be ignorant of the knowledge of God. God puts that knowledge in the heart of every man. Now that conscience is more than just the knowledge of God, but it includes the, the understanding inside that, that, that conscience that condemns. We all know what our conscience does to us whenever we sin or do something wrong. That conscience was given to us by God, and it was given to us to understand that we as sinners need to seek God for His help from our sin problem. And so, uh, look with me now to verse 32 of chapter 1. This knowledge that God put in the heart of every man, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things, and there's a whole list in the preceding verses of things that God uh, uh, describes as being wicked or evil things that men do, who knowing that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now drop down to uh, chapter 2. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doeth the same things. Your conscience is going to condemn you. You recognize it's wrong when you see another person do it, and so now when you do it, you're, you're condemning yourself also. Verse 2, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? So part of that conscience is the awareness that there is a God, and there's an accountability to Him. Uh, look at verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Some people uh, just, you know, they have a hard time uh, believing that there is a hell and they want to run to Paul and say that Paul didn't talk about hell. Well, this verse is very clear. What Paul's talking about is a reckoning from God against sinners. Uh, look at verse 6, who will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by uh, patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and, etern uh, and, and immortality, God will give eternal life. If, if you have a, a testimony of perfect righteousness all your lifetime, you have eternal life. Verse 8, But to them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, which is all of us, and obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Um, look at verse 14. For the, now, we're talking about conscience. We're talking about the awareness that there's a reckoning to God that should check sin in our lives, especially when it comes to the sins that we know are wrong, such as murder uh, and, and the other sins that are in the, t the commandments, and we'll look at those in a minute. Verse 14, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves. So the Gentiles... Or te give testimony, they're not under the law of Moses, and yet they give testimony often to their conscience, controlling themselves from doing the things that the law forbids them to do. Uh, verse 15, which shows the work of the law written in their hearts, notice, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Even the secrets of men that are done in the dark that no one knows, there is going to be a reckoning before God Almighty if you die in your sins and don't trust that Christ died to pay for your sins, to receive His righteousness, to save you from your sin problem and so that you can have eternal life. So if you reject God's way of saving you as a, a child born with a sin nature, 
that manifests itself. Do you have a conscience? You know you're a sinner. If you don't say, I believe Christ's death when he died on the cross to pay for the sins of all men, I'm going to trust in his death for my sins. And I want to receive the gift of eternal life. That's by faith trusting in the gospel to be saved today. Go to Genesis now, um, chapter 4. I want you to consider with me. Adam and Eve were created. They were given the volition, free will. God commanded them not to eat, eat of the tree in the garden. They did. But what happened in chapter 4? <clears throat> what happened to the first child born to Adam and Eve? What did he do to his younger brother? And I want you to look at this. Um, verse 2. And she bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. What did Cain do? Cain was, he, was, he loved to, to work with his hands in uh, growing food. And he no doubt grew food for his family, and he was very proud of, of the result of what he could cultivate the soil and make it do. And uh, so drop down now um, to verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel and his, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest, the ground it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shall thou be in the earth. And so Cain killed his brother Abel. The, the first born child to Adam and Eve murders his brother. So that sin nature manifests itself that early. Go to chapter 9 now of Genesis. And Cain knew he was wrong when he killed his brother. Actually, uh, I want you to go to chapter 6, verse, verse 5. Chap Genesis 6, 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping things, and the fowls of the air, that it, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Chapter 9, now verse 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For by the image of God, for in the image of God, God made he man. And you, be ye fruitful, and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. Uh, so God says, uh, uh, starting in after to Noah and his family, he tells them, uh, to be fruitful and multiply in verse 1, and he puts the fear of them on the animal uh, kingdom, and he says, every verse 3, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life there, thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. God forbids him to eat uh, meat that hasn't had the blood drained out of it, uh, out of the animal. When you, sacrifice, when you slaughter an animal after you've killed it for food, drain the blood. And surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of every man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. And so that's where the institution of capital punishment was given by God to check murder in the world. The world was so wicked prior to the flood, God uh, wiped everything out, made it started with, uh, made a new clean slate, started out with Noah and his family, and told them, if somebody kills another person, I'm requiring their blood at your hand. So the, the answer there to, uh, and that's a civil law, if you will. That restrains somebody from desiring, I, I don't like this person anymore, I'm going to kill him, from doing that. The only deterrent for murder is the uh, capital punishment to put the person to death who committed the murder. And that's how God controlled the problem. In Genesis chapter 10, we see that God set the bounds of the nations. And uh, 
and God confounded the languages at the Tower of Babel, and God instituted nationalism. And we don't have the time to, to go into these verses. I wish we did. But God instituted this just nationalism. I mean, it just he gave these different nations to divide the different tribes. You see that in chapter 10, verse 5. Um, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, one after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. So God's plan was to divide the nations. And the reason he did that, what happened at the Tower of Babel in, in Genesis 11, was instead of being multiplying and dispersing throughout the world like God planned for them to do, at the Tower of Babel, all the people were of one language, and they were united, and they, they united themselves together in defiance to God to build a tower to get to reach heaven. So they were trying to put themselves in the realm of heaven by building a physical tower to get there, instead of, and that's an example of religion, man working to get himself uh, into the heavens or immortality to work man working to satisfy the gods and the gods that that they were they were being uh, rebellious toward the God of heaven and earth that had just flooded the earth and commanded recently as as after the flood uh, shortly after the flood they they rebelled against God refused to, to scatter and do the God's will and instead they were no doubt worshiping the God of this world Satan Lucifer and in defiance to God and, and created a religion and there was all kinds of stuff going on back there that was more than just building the tower uh, in the, the, the religion that they were practicing. So God divided the nations so that individually, individual nations would have the ability to, to uh, implement laws to protect families, to protect uh, individuals, to have the free will to be able to worship God in the natural way that God commanded and desires that every child, man, woman, and child worships Him. Uh, today and so nationalism gives men liberty and freedom uh, go to Exodus chapter 20 Exodus 20 we have the Ten Commandments okay and in the Ten Commandments the first five basically describe that man is to worship God only and it's very specific it's not worship any supreme being that you think is God. He makes it very clear that man should have no other gods before him, Jehovah. And he's specific about he's a jealous God, verse 5. And God requires uh, that man worship him, the creator, the God who created all things. And there's only one God who has a book that says, I created all things, this is how I did it in Genesis, and that's Jehovah. Uh, so if you look at um, the last five commandments, they have to do with honoring your father and mother, uh, verse 12. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. A lot of people have problems with that today. Thou shalt, covet thy, uh, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house or anything that belongs to the, your neighbor. And so God makes it really clear you work for the things you have. You, don't, you aren't to steal from your neighbor to take his stuff, and you aren't to desire to do him harm in order to get his stuff. So the, the, the law is very clear. Go to Matthew 22. When uh, the, one of the Pharisees asked the Lord a question, what is the great commandment? And uh, what does the Lord tell him? Uh, chapter 22, what's the greatest commandment? Uh, verse 36, chapter 22, verse 36. Master, what is the great commandment? Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. And so, uh, go to, uh, well, for, for love is the fulfillment of the law. We don't have time to go uh, to, to the rest of the verses that I have for you this morning. But um, I do want to, um, I wanted to go through some verses, and, and maybe we'll do this next week, uh, to talk about how the Lord and the Apostle Paul said that we should submit to government and governmental authority as Christians. And we'll pick up here next time.